church, Jesus is Lord. That single belief calls us together as a community and sends us into our world with hope and purpose. At our church, your past will never define your future. There's always redemption, which means there's always a brighter day. At our church, we don't think we're better than any other church out there. We're just doing our best to become our best. At our church, we want you to believe in God, but we also want you to know that God believes in you. We are not against people who don't attend church anywhere. Instead, we pursue them with love, the very same love that's pursuing us. At our church, we're learning to serve God with all our hearts, and we're learning to worship Him with all our lives. And if you're looking for the perfect church, we're not it. At our church, we will make mistakes, but we will choose to grow from them. At our church, we're part of a global community that's knit together by the resurrection of Jesus. And by the way, at our church, we believe that really happened too. At our church, we will engage with people who are in real need because we are the hands and the feet of Christ. And finally, we need you to hear this loud and clear. At our church, it's not really our church at all. It's His. And we live and move and breathe in His church for His glory and His fame, not ours. So here's the invitation. You're invited to jump in with your whole heart at your own pace and to experience the life that awaits you in Christ. Friends, this is going to be good. Welcome to our church. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Portsmouth Christian Church. How are you doing today? Hold on. I can't hear. All right. We're so happy to have you here today. We are thankful for the great weather. I know the, the kids have something special planned outside, so I'm happy it's not 97 degrees. And I know Patrick is too. <laughs> and Heather. <laughs> So uh, at this time, if you would all please stand and sing with us. It's nice to have the little ones back in here with us. Make my heart pound. When 
when you feel the room You're here and I know you are moving I'm here and I know you will feel me Calm down Spirit, when you move, you make my heart pound When you feel the room You're here and I know you are moving I'm here and I know you will feel me Unfortunately, we are uh, short a drummer and a pianist this morning because uh, Val's not feeling well. She hurt her back and she got a pain in her neck. No, I'm not talking about Reed. See, if Sharon was here, she could go, but um. <laughs> and Sharon is not here with us either. They are actually. Um, uh, I had mentioned Friday Night at the Well, and some of you already knew this, but um, her daughter-in-law, she started having contractions. She's not due for over a month, probably five or six weeks, and um, she started having contractions on Friday, and they are actually keeping her until Monday just for monitoring, um, just, you know, just, just to be safe. So Sharon is with her little ones. So just the three of us, but that's all right. Charles is going to be back soon. <laughs> What holds your heart What stirs your soul What matters come to mind The cares you keep The thoughts you think it's not a wasted time Seeking you will find Joy 
still comes in the morning. Hope still walks with the hurting. Sometimes sorrow is the door to peace. Sometimes heartache is the gift I need. Your faith.
Lord is my shepherd, leads me to still waters, and he restores my soul. He restores my soul. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. Yes, he does. Yes, he does. Most gracious Heavenly Father, as we continue to praise and worship you in your house this morning, we take a pause to uh, reflect, Lord, on all these blessings in our lives, all the uh, monetary things and uh, earthly things that you've still given us, even when we need to not be focused on this world. At this moment, Lord, we're going to uh, reflect in our minds, and we're going to give back to you a portion, Lord, of what you've already given us. We ask you, Lord, to accept these tithes and these offerings and allow them to be used to further your kingdom here on earth and specifically here with Portsmouth Christian Church and around our community. We ask the Lord to bless these uh, gifts and the giver in your name. Amen.
rejoicing is for As we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, the Lord tells us, So then, when whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of our Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ will eat and drink judgment upon themselves. Then the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then, in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. At this time, we are going to recite the Lord's Prayer together. Um, if you haven't already memorized this, um, I do encourage you to do so. I use this prayer all the time when I just feel like I need to talk to God, but I don't know exactly what to say. So let's go ahead and, uh, and recite this together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Now, before we put up the five-minute timer, you're going to... Before we put up the five-minute timer, um, if Patrick will come up and Tim will come up, um, I want Kristen and Brendan and Christian, if you guys will come up. Uh, we've got three of our, our young people who are going to be heading back to college um, this weekend, and uh, we want to pray God's hand upon them that, uh, that God will watch over them and that he will protect them. And uh, we know that in the college world today, there are many things that can take you away from your Christian walk, uh, many things that can lead you down to the devil's trap. And uh, we're going to pray this morning that God will watch over our teenagers, that he will bless them with good grades um, and also with his mercy and grace. So we're going to pray for him this morning. If you guys would, if, uh, if you will kind of reach out your hand to... Uh, Put your hands on our teenagers so that we can watch over them. So if you would do that, I'd greatly appreciate it. Let us pray. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we just uh, thank you for today, and we thank you for Brennan. Um, he is going off to start his college journey, Lord, and just be with him. Help him to be clear-minded. Help him to stay on the right path and not venture down the wrong way, Lord, and just be with him. Help him with his schoolwork. Help him to stay focused and do what he needs to do, Lord, in your precious and holy name. Heavenly Father, we lift up Kristen to you this morning, Lord, that uh, you will be with her. 
uh, that you will guide her, that you will never leave her side. Show her your mercy and grace in everything that she does. Help her to maintain her uh, GPA the way it is, Lord. Father, give her the knowledge that is needed in everything that she does. And Father, where any temptation leads her way, may you fight it for her, that uh, she will put on the full armor of God, that she would be not only a defender against it, but a defender for you. Father, we love her. We thank her. Thank you for everything that she has done for us and it's been such a blessing to this church. Be with her, Lord, in Jesus' name. Lord, as we continue our prayer, uh, we pray for Christian today, Lord. We ask you to uh, guide him as he goes back to school for his second year, Lord. We ask you to continue to bless him in the sports arena where he's been excelling and setting some records, Lord. And we ask you to be with him and be present in those rehearsals and those practices for his sporting events. Allow him to be that example of a Christian soldier to uh, those around him in the sports field that maybe don't know you as well as he does. Uh, continue to bless him with success, Lord, so that others can see that uh, knowing you uh, does allow you to uh, provide earthly rewards. And at the same time, Lord, we ask you to uh, continue to be present while he studies his mechanical engineering degree to allow him to uh, complete those classes without any difficulties, Lord, so he can uh, have a double success, not only with sports, but with his academics. And in his uh, Christian walk with you, Lord, it won't uh, waver at all. We ask these uh, blessings in your holy name. Amen. So uh, we have a gift bag for Brendan since he's uh, heading off to college for the first time. Um, I just want to say a couple things. Um, I started coming to church here about four years ago, and about three years ago is when I started working with the youth, and it's been a pleasure to watch Brennan grow, and uh, me and him have kind of put together a special bond, and I know he looks up to me in I appreciate that and the things that he's done and the things that I know he's going to do. Um, I just wish him luck in uh, his endeavors at JMU. Um, not too far away. You can still come back and visit us, visit us every once in a while. But we uh, know you're going to do good things and continue to uh, grow. And uh, good luck.
Hey, good morning, good morning. <clears throat> Welcome to Portsmouth Christian Church. What a great day it is to be in the house of the Lord. Amen? Amen. Amen, amen. Thanks, everybody, for coming out this morning. Uh, it's a beautiful morning where the weather's starting to break a little bit, and uh, it's not as hot and muggy in the mornings as it usually is, and this thing's going to drive me crazy again today. Um, but uh, thanks for coming out and being with us this morning. It's a blessing to have you here. i uh, got a couple of announcements uh, we're making this morning. Oh, uh, by the way, where did, where did Sammy go? Oh, man. Yeah, um, Chris is not here today doing our, our uh, audio video, and Sammy was back there filling in for him, and I just wanted to let him know what a great job he's done and, and uh, thank him for uh, filling in for us, but he ain't here, so... He missed out. So, but anyway, a couple of uh, calendar events this morning. We have got a small group this Wednesday night. We just finished First Peter, uh, so we will actually be on Second Peter chapter one this Wednesday night. Come out and be with us. Hear the word of God. Uh, study it word by word for word, and understand more about His word. Uh, jam week nights. I think this Wednesday night will be the last Wednesday night that they're having that because of school getting ready to start back. So um, get your teens and your kids and let them come out and uh, enjoy a good time um, with what they're doing back in the back. They've had some good times back there. Brendan's talked about it or, and a couple other people have talked about uh, things that they're doing and uh, it seems to be a good time. Um, our outdoor movie night, uh, Friday, August 19th at 8 o'clock. Uh, we'll have it out on the lawn. It's going to be... Uh, the Promise of the Pilgrimage, Pilgrimage some, I don't know, something like that. Um, but uh, it's going to be outside. We'll have snow cones and popcorn available and uh, ice, uh, ice water if you want to drink. Um, also, Miss Donna was saying, <clears throat> if you want to do the backpacks, they have them at the dollar store? Five and below for $5, uh, the backpacks, if you can grab a couple of those. And um, water bottles, I didn't realize, but they have to be plastic. So um, you can go to the dollar store and get them from the dollar store. But if you don't have a sheet yet, there's a sheet behind Reed right there that has all the first grade through uh, the fifth grade on there. Um, grab one of those. Let's help uh, supply the kids that are in need at, uh, at the uh, school up here that we sponsor, Waterview, and um, let's, let's give them a hand. So please, please, if you can't buy everything that's on one list, buy a few items and bring it in and we'll replace the rest of it but we want to make sure that the kids have it today. Um, I want to talk to you this morning about knowing the time. And I read about a family that had a t-ball game, and we know how hectic that is to try to get kids ready to go to a t-ball game. And they got up that morning and ate their breakfast and uh, had to be at the field, they thought, at 11 o'clock. So... Uh, 10 minutes to 11 pulls up and they get to the field and the coach and the team is nowhere to be found. And to come to find out, they call the coach and the coach said, well, the game was at 10 o'clock. So they were late. They didn't get to play in the game. The thing about that is, is the importance of knowing what time it is and what you have to do at that time. Let me ask you a question this morning. What time is it? Look at your watch. What time do you have? Half yeah, past the freckle. That's what I got too, Ricky. We're right on time, buddy. <clears throat> you know, the thing about it is, is I don't wear a watch because it kind of irritates me. Uh, my wife has bought me several. I used to collect fossil watches. I've got quite a few of those. They look good in my drawer. They look really good in the drawer. I can open up my drawer. They look so nice. But um, I don't wear them because they kind of irritate me. And, and um, plus, you know, I'll, I, I, I want to keep messing with it all the time so I don't wear a watch. But however, to fulfill our obligations today, we need to know the time. Our scripture today begins with the phrase, understanding the present time. Or in the New King James Version, it says, knowing the time. Take a look at Romans 13, 11 through 14. It says, and do this, understanding the present time. The hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber. Because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of the darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in carious and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality or debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ 
And do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. How many of you guys here today believe that God is not bound by our time? You see, we can say that it is 1140, 1141, 1142, but God says, no, it's not. It's my time. You know, I was talking to somebody yesterday and they were doing something and I forgot who it was, but they said, I did it because it wasn't, God wasn't doing it fast enough for me. We had a men's fellowship breakfast yesterday and if you missed it, um, you missed a great time. It was, uh, we had some eggs and, and some sausage and we had some pancakes and um, Reed had his tofu stuff and um, we all had a good time fellowshipping together and we asked a couple of questions. And one of the questions was, is what in your life do you feel like that you do not have good self-control? And when you do not have good self-control of yourself, where is it in your life that you find that that distracts you from being Christ-like? And we talked about, like many people talk about, road rage. A lot of us have road rage to where we are not Christ-like when we pull up beside somebody, we stick our middle finger up at them, or we roll the window down and tell them to get into the right lane, or we do a lot of these things. And that happens out on the road today. The only problem with that is, is there's a lot of people out there today that have guns and they would love to shoot you. And so you have to be very careful. But what I was saying is, is that we don't have self-control over, control over road rage. So therefore, the road rage helps us from, or deters us from being Christ-like. The first thing is called self-control. You have to control yourself. But God is working up a time when he went in this age and we will move on to another one. We who are Christians need to be aware of this and know that it is time for us to do certain things. According to the passage before us this morning that we read, the first thing is, it is time for us to wake up. Not only is it time for us to wake up as far as Jesus coming back, but it's time for us to wake up in what hap what's happening in the world today. We need to take back our world and our country for Jesus Christ. The only way to do that is with a voice. But I see so many people that like to make fun of other people. They like to poke fun at other people instead of loving them back to Christ. When Paul talks about knowing the time, he's not talking about the chronological time such as 1145 on August 14th, 2022. Instead, he's talking about an epic time, an era, or a time in which we live. We are actually living in the last times before Jesus is to take us home. So therefore, if we really believe that, if we believe what that verse says, that we are nearer today of Jesus coming back than we were yesterday, then it is time for us to wake up. We think about when somebody's not with it mentally or spiritually, we often wonder, when that person will come around and wake up and face reality and do what is necessary. We talk about this as what? Getting a wake up call. Sometimes we have to get a wake up call in our life. You know, I see today that we don't have as many people as we usually have. And it's easy for us to get into the habit of not getting to church. But in the end, God will give us a wake up call that we need to be back in church that we need to be reading our bibles that we need to be praying all the time because god says i have to be first no matter what therefore we need a wake up call first corinthians 15:34 says this come back to your senses as you ought to and stop sinning for there are some who are ignorant of god I say this to you to your shame. What is he saying here? Paul is saying that there are some of you who know how to do right and know God's will, but you are being ignorant to that will. What he says is, I shame you. How many of us like to be shamed? Part of us don't even want to be held accountable anymore. Why? Because when I hold you accountable, what happens? I've offended you. Who are you to tell me that I should come to church? Who are you to tell me that I can't miss one or two weeks? Well, I'm nobody, but God is everybody. And God says that if we are Christians and we love him, then we will want to be together with like-minded people. 
We as Christians can very easily be unconscious to the things of God. We ignore them. We're saved, but it doesn't sink into us as what we should be doing. We as Christians are often unresponsive to the Word of God. You see, I think um, about Ricky. I was talking to him yesterday on the phone and wondering how he was doing and things like that um, because he shamed me because I hadn't been calling him. And um, I felt shame, so I said, I guess I'll have to call him or he won't love me anymore. So I called him yesterday and then I was actually kidding with him because I didn't think he would be here today. And I said, well, uh, I guess I'll see you in church tomorrow, right? And he said, well, Andrew is probably going to set up something where I can watch church at home. But guess what? He's here. Why? Because he loves God and he loves the church. You see, this is Christ's bride right here. We should love church almost more than anything in our lives. Because this is the bride of Christ. He died for this church. He died for us that we could live eternally without condemnation. Why wouldn't you want to be in church? Why wouldn't you want to please God in every way? Do you think it pleases God when you roll over and say, I'm too tired to come to church? Do you think it pleases God when you say, well, I've got to cut my grass today because I didn't get to do it yesterday because it was raining? Do you think it pleases God when you say, you know what, i got a tea time at 7 o'clock to play golf and I'm not going to be able to make church this week? What if God was to say that to us? You know, Tim, I would really love to bless you, but really I've got something else more important right now. You know, Tim, I would really love to, to uh, cure you of everything that's going on in your life, but really I've got to look after somebody else. What if God did that to us? We would say, man, what an unfair God. Are we being fair to God when we don't attend church? No, we're not. We're being unfair. Now, I know there are times when you're on vacation. I know there's times when you're sick. I get it. I understand it. Life happens. But I believe that with every ounce of my body, that when we are able, we need to be sitting in church. We need to be understanding better what God wants us to do with our life. Because 1 Corinthians says, come back to your senses as you ought to and stop sinning. You see, I believe with all my heart that when we do things other than come to church and we know we ought to be in church, that we're sinning against God. Why? Because we're not giving God the time that he deserves, that he has graciously earned. You see, we as Christians are often unresponsive to the word of God. The preacher gives a message and we know he's right and then he gives a challenge to us to fix what's wrong to make a decision for Christ and to do better or to do what the Bible even tells us to do. And we go home and, and within about 10 minutes, we forget what he said. You see, the thing about it is, is I told a story one time about a team, a football team, and they got on the field and it was the first game and they were so excited, man. They were ready to play. And they got on the field and the quarterback said, we're gonna do a 32 draw, ready, break. And they broke and every one of them went and they sat on the sidelines. And then they came and they got back in the huddle again for the second down. And he says, okay, we're going to run 32 draw again. Ready, break. And they went and they sit on the sidelines. What good is the preparation you do if you're not going to use what you've prepared for? That's the same way within church. That we come in here and the preacher gives us the play. And he says, okay, stop sinning. Don't sin anymore. What you need to do is you need to love God better. You need to love people better. And we say, okay, ready, break. And we go out the door and we tell somebody we hate them. You see, we didn't use what we prepared in here for out there. We forget within about 10 or 15 minutes what the preacher or, or the teacher has instructed us to do because we have become unresponsive to God's word. A 77-year-old man in Palm Harbor, Florida was a sleepwalker. And one day he got out and James Kearns was his name and he sleepwalked out of the house and he had his cane with him, he stumbled down an embankment, embankment, and he didn't wake up until he got stuck in an alligator-infested pond. A neighbor heard him hollering for help and called the police around 5 a.m., and Mr. Kearns was found fighting off the alligators with his cane in his hand. There was eight to ten alligators all around him, ready to devour him. If he hadn't woken, he'd been gator breakfast. But I believe today that sleepwalking and sleep living will get you into trouble. If we sleep on God, we will be in trouble.
We need to wake up, understand what God wants us to do, understand God's purpose for our life, and not forget it when we leave the building, but go out and do what he's called us to do. You know, it was uh, Friday night, uh, the PCC praise team sang at the well. And um, we invited one of the gentlemen that come to the well. His name is Tim also. He's a great guy. It's a great name. Um, but he, he, we invited him to come to, to the men's breakfast yesterday. And he showed up at the men's breakfast. But what if they hadn't have played at the well on Friday night and nobody had invited him? He wouldn't have came. You see, they were using what God had given them talent-wise to, to, to witness to other people, which gave us an opportunity to say, hey, look, come and be with us in church. You see, we can't forget everything that we learn on Sunday, Monday through Saturday. We have to live what we learn on Sunday, Monday through Saturday. And you say, well, Tim, wait a minute, weren't we saved through the plan of salvation? Yes, we were, but believing is only the first step. Because think about this. James 2.19 says this. You say you have faith, for you believe there is one God. Good for you. Even the demons believe this, and they tremble in terror. Do you know I believe that some of the demons know the Bible more than we do? That they know it from front to back, and they understand what it says? Why do I believe that? Because I believe that's how they know how to attack us. Because they know the word of God. It says right there that even the demons believe this. They believe in God. They know he exists. And they tremble in terror. You see, we have to be able to fight them with the word of God. How do we do that? Like Jesus did when he had been in the wilderness for 40 days and the devil tempted him. How did he fight him? With the word of God. He didn't fight it with his own words. He fought him with the word of God. Do not put the Lord your God to test. Man does not live by bread alone. Where did all this come from? It come from the Holy Scriptures. That's how we fight the devil, with Holy Scriptures. You must repent. You must confess of your sins and be baptized. But does our salvation really end at baptism? Not really. Salvation is in three tenses, past, present, and future. The first one is called justification, and that's the past. At a specific moment in time, I believed on the finished work of Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection for my sins. But likewise, I was buried, uh, death, burial, and resurrection through baptism to remove my sins. Romans 6, 4 says this, We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may have a new life. For we know that our old self was crucified with him, so that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. And Romans 6, 7 says, Because anyone who has died has been freed from sin. Once I am baptized, it is just as I have never sinned. Romans 4.25, he has delivered over to death for our sins and was raised for our justification. You see, God's grace, when we are baptized, we claim the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus now upon us, that we die to our old way and we become a new way. So the first one is justification, and that is the past. The second one is sanctification, and that is the present. We are growing in Christ on a daily basis to live a holy life. Through our justification in Christ, the Holy Spirit comes in and sanctifies us. See, the justification is when Jesus saves us. The sanctification comes when the Holy Spirit dwells within us. 2 Thessalonians 2.13 says this, But we ought to always to thank God for you, brothers, loved by the Lord. Because from the beginning, God chose you to be saved through the sanctifying work of the Spirit and through the belief in the truth. 1 Thessalonians 5.23 says, May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
You see, there is no salvation apart from sanctification. If we, if we desire to grow, if no desire in us to be holy, we must question our justification. Why are we not wanting to grow spiritually on a daily basis? And the third thing we talked about is the future, and that's glorification. We talked about justification, sanctification, and now glorification, which is our future. This is when the Lord comes back for his church. 1 Peter 1.21 says this, Through him you believe in God who raised him from the dead and glorified him. And so your faith and hope are in God. When Christ rose from the dead through the power of God, he associated and ascended into heaven. And there he sits at the right hand of the Father as the King of kings and Lord of lords. And one day something similar will happen to us. That Jesus will come through the clouds on the white horse. We will hear the great trumpet sound. It says the lightning will be seen from the east to the west. And Jesus will call his children home. We will in that day be with, in the presence of Jesus himself. You see, I don't believe that when we get to heaven that Jesus will still be hidden from us. We will be able to see Jesus face to face. We will be able to look upon him and his wonder and his glory. If he came right now, would we be delighted to see him and be unashamed or would we, would we be ashamed of our condition that we're in right now? Think about that, guys. If Jesus was to come through those clouds right now, would we be delighted to see him and be unashamed of the things that we are doing? Or would we be ashamed of our condition? Be aware of this. The most important part, when Christ comes, it'll be too late to pray. It'll be too late to live a godly life. It'll be too late to witness to the unsaved. It must be done now. It's time for us to wake up. So the three things of the uh, salvation is the justification, the sanctification, and the glorification. But it's also time for us to walk. Our walk refers to what? Our conduct. There's a positive conduct in the verse which we should talk, our walk. There's also a negative conduct in the verse in which we should not walk. There are times when growing up that I didn't act the way that the Todd family should act and my dad let me know about it. You see, there was a certain way that we had to act. And if we didn't act that way, then my dad would straighten it out. You see, he sent my brother one time to get a haircut and he came back and he had only just a little bit um, taken off. And my dad said, nope. So he gave him more money. He said, now go get it cut right. The thing about it was, is my dad had a way that we should be living in a line that we should walk. And if we didn't do it, then he would straighten us out. But guess what? God gives us a line that we should walk and a straight way that we shouldn't walk. Why shouldn't we understand if he tries to straighten us out if we don't walk that line? Well, that's an unfair God. He shouldn't do that. Yes, he should. Why? Because what he wants is for you to have an eternal life with him. And in order to do that, we must walk that straight and narrow way. We should find it joy, Paul says, that when God disciplines us. Why? Because he loves us so much that he wants us to do what is right. Think about if you're on the job and you don't do it the way it's supposed to be done, you hear about it from your boss. For Christians, there's a code of behavior. As Christians, we should be the day and not the night. How many of you guys out here know that your mom and dad says, after midnight, there ain't none but hoodlums out there. You don't need to be out there after midnight. You see, bad things happen when? At night. When we go to war, when do we usually strike? At night. Why? Because bad things happen in the night. Jesus says we need to live as the day, not the light. Anyone who is no good and is in the dark. This leads to how we should not walk. 
In that verse that we read, Romans 13, 11 through 14, it says, do not walk in rioting, reverie, orgies. Do not walk in drunkenness. Do not walk in sexual immorality. Do not walk in debauchery or lewdness. Do not walk in dissension or strife. And do not walk in jealous envy. How many of us want what somebody else has? You see, that's envy. That's jealousy. We shouldn't walk in that. We should be excited for them and what they have and what they get. God has blessed them. Why shouldn't he bless them? And you say, well, I know, Tim, but, you know, I'm a Christian and I live right down the line and I do everything that God wants me to do. But my heathen that lives across the street, he lives as a heathen and he cusses and he drinks and he smokes and he does all this. But God is still blessing him. Well, that's not up for you to debate. God can bless anybody that he wants to bless. Maybe he's blessing them to show how much and how good he is to them so that they will come to him. Stop worrying about what God is doing for somebody else and worry about what you're doing for God. You see, we forget that sometimes. We're so busy worrying about what God is doing for somebody else, we forget to do what God wants us to do. You see, we turn around and we're envious of them. That's not what God wants us to do. Doesn't matter how much you dislike it. That's God's choice. Then it's a time, we had a time to uh, wake up, we had a time to walk, and now it's a time to wear. You know, I wear different clothes for different occasions, and when we're painting around the house, I'll put on some old pants or old shorts and an old shirt, because I can promise you I'm going to get as much paint on me as I get on the wall. It's just how it is. So we wear old clothes. But when you go to a, a, a wedding or a funeral or something like that, you at least like try to put on a nice attire. Maybe not a tie anymore. You used to wear ties all the time to church. It was kind of like a requirement for men, but um, now it's not. But you, you kind of wear something that's halfway decent. Before you and I became Christians, we thought certain things to be acceptable behavior. But these things turned out to be sinful and now that we are Christians, we need to change into different clothes. We need to take off our night clothes of sin and put on our day clothes of righteousness. We need to undress by taking off the works of the darkness. We must decide to remove those things which do not please God and still left from our old lives. You see, we need to put on the armor of light. Ephesians 6, 13 says, Therefore, put on the full armor of God. So when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything, to stand. You see, it's one thing to put on a team uniform, such as the Braves or the Yankees, the Cubs, the Cardinals, whatever. It's quite another thing to act like one of their star players, like maybe Greg Maddox or Ryan Sandberg or Yadier Molina. You see, we have, in a sense, our team uniform. We are Christians. We are to live like the star of the team, Jesus Christ. You see, we can wear a jersey from a Major League Baseball team or an NFL team or a hockey team or whatever it is, but most of the time we don't need to act like those people do. And I'm not judging anybody because I don't know their hearts. I don't know who they are. You just see how they act sometimes. If you don't believe it, watch YouTube. But when we put on the armor of God and dress like our team leader, then we need to act like our team leader, and that's Jesus Christ. We have an advantage over me trying to be any of those players. The Lord Jesus lives inside of me, and I can put him on by faith. You see, I cannot live for the Lord and live my old sinful life as well. I need to be continually putting on the armor of Jesus Christ and taking off the flesh at the same time. What did Paul say? When I want to do good, evil's right there with me. What does that mean? When I want to do good, that's the spiritual way of doing things. But when evil is right there with me, that's my fleshly desire. You see, we battle with that all the time. If you say you don't, you're lying. Well, how do I know that? Because we have demons that are around us that are telling us that we should do this or we should do that. And our, our spiritual life says, no, you shouldn't do that or do this. You see, that's the way it works. I cannot serve the Lord and yet live for my fleshly desires. 
I denounce the old sinful habits and put them off. I put Christ on and imitate him. In a way, the clothes do make the man. Put him in an old dingy clothes and he will have a sloppy attitude. Put him in a suit and a tie and he's a different person. We need to change clothes. Galatians 3.27 says, For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. You see, we now are clothed ourselves with the ways and the Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ. Think about this. If you have a bowl up here, and I was going to do this this morning, but I did, just didn't do it. You had a bowl and it's full of water and you had a t-shirt, a white t-shirt. And you put red dye into that water and you stirred it up and then you stuck that t-shirt inside of that dye. What would that t-shirt look like? It would come out red, right? Why? Because there would be no longer a white cloth, there would be a red cloth. The white cloth is in the dye and the dye is in the cloth. Same way, when we have Jesus, we are in Jesus, and Jesus is in us. Nobody can take that away from us. Paul connects being baptized into Christ with being clothed with Christ. We are now dressed in the garment of His righteousness. We have a brand new identity in Him. We are saturated with His presence. The garment that Christ gives us to wear brings a behavior that is Christ-like. This behavior looks the same in all believers, or it should look the same in all believers. How many of you have seen people that you say, man, I would love to be Christ-like like that guy or that lady? You know, I look at my mom and I say, man, whew, that's a lady of God. I want people to say that about Tim too. Not a lady of God, but a man of God. Don't you want people to say that about you? If something was to happen to you, don't you want somebody to say, man, that was a lady of God. When she was around, I could feel the Holy Spirit. Oh, that was a man of God. When he was around and he spoke, I could hear the Holy Spirit coming out. That's what we should desire for. You know, I don't want people to say, well, Tim, you know, he was a very successful person and he gained this and he gained that. No, I want people to say he loved God and he loved people. That's all that matters, guys. Think about, and I almost did this one today too, but I didn't. I should start doing some of these things. We look at Superman and Clark Kitt's running around the town and all of a sudden something happens and they need him to be Superman. What happens? He goes into a phone booth most of the time. He closes the door, he takes off his shirt and he's got what? A big S on his chest. You see, that's the way we should be. That when we get into people and we have discussions with them, we should be able to take off our shirt and have a big JC on our shirt. We should become somebody like Jesus. Not that we shouldn't all the time, but we should show it more when we're talking to other people. See, we need to get excited about talking to Jesus instead of just mumbling things about Jesus. You see, I believe that when I sin and I go to Jesus and I say, Jesus, please forgive me of my sins, I don't believe he goes to the Father and says, hey, Dad, will you forgive him? No, I believe he goes and says, hey, Tim sinned, but please forgive him. I take the wrath for him. I took the wrath for him on the cross and I died for him. Forgive him. I believe he speaks up on our behalf. Why aren't we speaking up for him? It's time for us to wake up. It's time for us to walk up and it's time for us to wear up. In other words, not only talk the talk, but walk the walk. I know a lot of people that know how to talk the talk, buddy. They can tell you any verse that you want to know. Doesn't matter. But Paul said in Corinthians, he said, it doesn't matter if you know the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. It doesn't matter if you know every single word where it says in the beginning, in the very first, and at the end it says, Jesus, come, Jesus. That's the last words in the Bible. It doesn't matter. If you don't live by what it says, the, the knowledge of that book doesn't mean anything. You can learn the whole Bible, but if you don't act it out, it doesn't mean anything. You've wasted your time. It's nothing but another book that you've learned and studied. Who's coming up? You see, our God gives us a choice. 
to believe the message or not. He said, the choice is yours. I'm putting it out there for you to hear. I'm putting it out there for you to know. I'm putting it out there for you to live. But he gives us a choice on whether we live it or not. By the way we act, we're either telling the world two things. That we live for the world or that we live for Christ. What would Jesus do? We put on the Lord Jesus first by baptism. Second, by allowing the Holy Spirit to develop us in a Christ-like character. And thirdly, living a life worthy to be called Christ-like. If you don't know Jesus as your personal Savior this morning, I just pray that you'll come down and change that because Jesus is coming. Whether we believe it or not, He's coming. And also, if you're broken or bruised this morning or beaten or just need uh, stress relief or whatever, please come down and let's pray about it this morning. I'll give you a few minutes. God sent His Son They called Him Jesus just telling me that um, Andrea has uh, texted her and Andrea doesn't usually ask for prayer we always pray for Andrea but she doesn't usually ask for it but uh, Andrea says she's in so much pain she can hardly stand it so we're going to pray for her and also uh, her friend April um, has been taken to the hospital and is in hospice care and um, her, her husband wants to be there with her but he can't because he has a, a handicapped elderly son that he has to see after so you know, we think about sometimes when we're going through things in life that it can't get any worse. Trust me, it can get a lot worse. We are blessed, blessed people. You know, and, and we've got a, a little small crowd today, and that's okay. And my wife, she worries about that, you know, and she, she feels for me. And she says, Tim, you preach, and I want you to preach to a, to, to a large crowd. And I'm like, it doesn't bother me. I'm preaching to the ones who are here because God told me to. And he knows who needs to be here and who is not going to be here. He knows it before Sunday ever comes. And it's okay. Because I love you guys. And I love the ones that are not here. It's okay. It's not about the numbers. It's not, guys. It's about the Holy Spirit and what we have in Jesus Christ. I want more of that. I want you to have more of that. So I'll preach to who's here. If one of you show up, I'm a priest to one of you. Don't matter. It's okay. God is good. God is great all the time. So let's pray, and then we'll head out today. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful day that you have given us. Father, I just pray uh, this morning for the anointing of your Holy Spirit to be in this building. You said where two or more are gathered together, you are there with us, and we believe it wholeheartedly we believe that your presence is here 
Father, thank you for loving us so much that you allowed your son to die upon that cross that he can be in us as we are in him. Father, I pray for Andrea today, Lord, who's going through this pain. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ right now, Father, that you will lay your hand upon her with your Holy Spirit, that you will take every ounce of pain from head to toe. It will be dissolved and gone. Father, we know that you are continuing to work a miracle in her life, and we are not doubting you one bit. Father, we know that you are capable of anything. We serve the God of impossible. Father, I pray that you continue to bless her. Father, I pray for April as uh, she is going through this hospice care. I pray for her husband, Lord, that you will give him peace, knowing that, yes, he wants to be uh, with his wife. And I understand that greatly, Lord. And Father, we pray that somehow, some way, you will give him the opportunity to be there with her. Father, not to discard his son or his child, Lord, but Father, that he can be with his wife in the last days. But Father, I pray the anointing upon them with your Holy Spirit that if she doesn't know you, that she will call upon your name. Father, bless us, Lord, as we leave here today. Watch over us, guide us, guard us, direct us. Lead us into your way, Lord. Show us that how to put on the full armor of God to protect our lives against the evil one. Be with us, Lord, as we leave. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys. Thank you.